and welcome you all to Family Consumer Sciences at Home. I do want to remind you if you have questions, you are welcome to put them in the uh, Zoom chat or in the Facebook Live comments. We do have moderators who are watching each um, of those formats and they will then of course get that question on to our presenter. And that is, our presenter is Dr. Alex Ellswick. He is the Extension Specialist for um, Substance Use Prevention and Recovery. And as I, you heard me say the, he is the only one and might still be the only one in the country. Is that right, Alex? Oh, All yeah. right. Uh, so Alex topic, uh, Alex's topic is everybody is recovering from something. And I'm gonna turn it over to him. All right, well, good morning and welcome, good afternoon rather, and welcome to everybody. Um, if you're watching on Facebook Live, on Zoom, welcome to you. If you know, you're watching the recording later on, wherever you are, whenever you are, welcome and, and we're glad you're here. Um, to start off with, I thought I'd just share, I just thought of this, this is funny. Um, the church that I used to attend here in Lexington started doing virtual programming, uh, doing like streaming services long before COVID-19. And they started calling it, the church is called Crossroads, they started calling it Crossroads Anywhere except my family and I would call it Crossroads Underwear because you could watch it in your underwear. So in many ways, this is family and consumer sciences underwear that you can take anywhere. So I'm glad you're with us. Um, we have some, some seriously uh, important information to talk about today. Um, and I wanna give you an idea of sort of how it is that I arrived at wanting to talk about all of us recovering from something and, and self-care for all of us. Um, because initially when, I learned that, that in response to COVID-19, we were gonna have to, to um, mobilize all of our extension services online for virtual programming. My first thought was to prioritize what's the information that Kentuckians need the most. And of course, since um, my subject matter is substance use prevention and recovery, I was thinking, what's the information, what are the impacts on prevention and recovery that people need to know the most? So I started building this presentation, focusing on how treatment, prevention, people in recovery are being impacted, all these sorts of things. And as I was building that presentation, I saw Dr. Kostelik's presentation on positive thinking. And two things that I think were really great about her presentation. And the first is just the optimism that um, filled and permeated her presentation. I genuinely appreciated that. I think it's a time when mental health may be a little tenuous for all of us and a time when we really need some optimism and some positivity. And so I appreciated that. And secondly, um, even though Dr. Kostelik is a gerontologist and even though her work focuses on older adults, she chose to, to discuss subject matter that really applied to all of us. And um, it got me thinking about my subject matter and how if all I were to do is to arm you with information to serve people in recovery or um, in prevention or whatever it is, but we didn't take care of ourselves first, we'd be doing a, a big injustice. So you all have probably seen this idea before, the, the concept that you can't pour from an empty cup, that uh, this is kind of a principle of self-care. We have to take care of ourselves first in order to be of service to other people. Uh, a similar but different metaphor I prefer um, is the metaphor of an oxygen mask. So if you grab the, the emergency pamphlet when you're on a flight, you'll notice that the caregiver is always encouraged to put on his or her oxygen mask before assisting a child. And I think they deliberately tell you that um, as a part of the directions. And the reason for that is uh, if you don't have oxygen and you don't have what you need, you're, you're not going to be capable of helping other people get what they need. So this is really the principle of self-care. And it's also why I decided that our focus on impacts on the addiction and recovery community needs to come after a discussion of self-care. So I'll promote this again a little bit later uh, at the end, but we'll really begin talking about COVID-19's impact on my whole subject matter next month. I had already started building some of that presentation, but, uh, but I thought first we really needed to talk about something that applies to every single person who's hearing this, and that's how do I take care of myself? And before we launch into it, I have one more disclaimer that I wanna share, and that is this. Um, sometimes, the, the, the notion that all we need is a little self-care to address whatever we're dealing with can be really insulting. And the reason I know this is because as a person in recovery, when I was early in my struggles, I had people tell me that I needed to do a little self-care. 
And it feels kind of dismissive and kind of flippant when somebody's really struggling with something difficult. And we know um, even before COVID-19, but especially during this time, there are folks who are really struggling maybe to put food on the table. Maybe folks who don't know where they're laying their head at night. So some of these self-care activities may seem superfluous. Like I can't, I don't have time to be dealing with that now. So I think it's important that we validate that and acknowledge that some people are in that place. But having said that, I'm gonna double down and suggest to you that every single strategy I'm gonna talk about today is evidence-based and every single strategy that I'm gonna talk about today is free and afford, uh, available to every, every single person, everyone, all of us. And, um, and for that reason, I think it's useful to all of us. So I thought I would begin by talking a little bit about, um, you know, if, if we're going to suggest that we're all in recovery from something, then we need to know what recovery is. What, do you, what even is recovery? And so I've, I've included SAMHSA's definition of recovery here. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So they deal with addiction, substance use, but also mental health. And they call this their working definition of recovery. And I love that because what it suggests is that this is not something that we define one time. And uh, instead, this is, this is a living definition, something that changes as we learn more about research. So here's how SAMHSA defines recovery today. Recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. So a, a couple of things to note out of that definition, just as we're getting started, is there's no mention of drugs or alcohol. No mention whatsoever, no mention of abstinence or sobriety, no mention of using less drugs or alcohol, no mention at all. And the reason for that is because recovery happens irrespective of drug and alcohol use, right? When we're talking about recovery, we're not talking about not putting something in our body. What we're talking about is uh, global health and wellness. We're talking about having autonomy and our ability to make decisions for ourselves and the ability to become who we were meant to be the ability to become the best version of ourselves. And that definition, I think, fits absolutely every single one of us. It doesn't matter what it is that you would, would suggest you're recovering from. Maybe you're recovering from uh, a, a mental health condition. Maybe you struggle with anxiety or depression. Maybe you're recovering from an unhealthy relationship. Maybe from a trauma in your past. I suggested as I was doing the promo on the news this morning, maybe it's something less significant. Maybe it's just you're recovering from spending a long week in quarantine with your spouse, right? Could be any number of things. But the reality is that uh, this definition of recovery applies to all of us. And, and so we're all recovering from something. Um, and the reality is that at this time, uh, we could use a little bit of recovery because uh, when you look at data on the way that we're behaving in the midst of COVID-19, um, what you see is a portrait of um, an American culture that's trying really hard to cope and maybe a little unsure of how it needs to cope. So some early data suggests that alcohol sales are up as much as 55% in 2020. Um, states that have legalized cannabis have seen an increase in cannabis sales of about 20 percent. Um, you may have heard people jokingly refer to the quarantine 15, which is sort of like the, the freshman 15, I suppose, um, because we may not be focusing on our eating habits and nutrition as well as we were prior to COVID-19. And maybe that weight gain is, is better explained by the lack of exercise. So I saw a study of like 75,000 fitness trackers, things like Fitbits, um, and they found that on the whole, Americans are moving less, exercising less, sleeping more, and not necessarily getting more hours of good quality sleep. So when you summarize that little bit of data right there, what you see, in my mind at least, is uh, an American culture that is struggling to cope, that is struggling to find ways, um, healthy ways to deal, maybe even a culture that's looking to escape a little bit. And that's, that's something that we have seen historically. So um, this is from Bohr and colleagues in 2013. And I just pulled out one graph because I wanted to show you the impact on binge drinking during the Great Recession. So this is probably the most recent um, difficult time that we've gone through as a country um, that I think can be somewhat compared to COVID-19 would be the Great Recession. And just when the housing market burst in 08, you see a sharp increase in binge drinking, 
right? So this is historically what we do as a culture. This is really what we do across the world is we look for ways to cope. And when there's a lot of pressure exerted on society, right, we look for a safety valve. And in this case, that seems to have been binge drinking. So those forms of self-care that we've just described are not effective, right? Um, that's, that's, that's escapism. That's not self-care. Uh, Brianna Weist is an author who has, I think, the very best characterization of self-care that I've ever heard. And she writes, true self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It's making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. So that bears repeating. True self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It's making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. And when you look at this definition and you consider massages and playing golf and salt baths and chocolate cake, you can understand why those things aren't self-care. That's an escape. That's actually the same thing as using a drug, as taking a cigarette break um, or using heroin. You're, you're, you're escaping from something there. You're coping, but not effectively, right? Not in a healthy way. What we want to do with self-care is more intentionally, more proactively construct a life that, that we live in such a way that we don't need to run to salt baths and chocolate cake. It doesn't mean those are bad things. They aren't inherently bad. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a bath or uh, a piece of cake. But if it's being used as an escape, that's not a form of self-care, right? So I like that the intention um, that is set by this way of characterizing self-care. And it also reminds me then of a book. Um, I've been teaching a class for a few years um, at UK. And as a part of that class, I've been teaching a book called The How of Happiness. And I would encourage you to check it out. It's a great book. It's a pretty easy read. Um, it's written by Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky, who I think she's a professor at Stanford now, but she's considered one of the leading experts on research on happiness. And so this book is a pretty easy read, but a great explanation of a lot of the science behind what makes us happier. And the reason I include it here is because on the cover of her book, she has this pie chart that is quite literally a pie chart. Um, and what you notice is that 40% of the pie is missing. And that is intended to represent the 40% of your happiness that is within your power to change. So let's break that down for a second. What Dr. Lubomirsky suggests in all of the research that she's done and in doing a literature review of all the research that exists, is she says about half of your happiness, about half of what determines your, your level of happiness is genetic. About 50% is genetic, all right? Um, it gives us a set point, a set range within uh, which we will fall. We can't change that, we can't impact that. About 10% of your happiness is life circumstances. So living during coronavirus or going through a divorce or um, a bankruptcy, things like that that may impact your happiness is only 10%. And then the other 40% of what determines how happy you are is within your control. And I think for me, that's the biggest takeaway of her book is saying happiness isn't just um, an arbitrary accidental result of life. Happiness is the result of deliberate intentional activity. It's the result of taking care of yourself. And so what I want to talk about today is that 40%. I want to be focusing on what are the things that are within our control that we can use to intentionally improve our quality of life. I can't imagine that there's a single person listening to this right now who would say, I don't want to improve my quality of life. All of us do, and all of us have a vested interest in doing that. And the better that we do that, and the better that we take care of ourselves, the fuller our cup, right? The better secured our oxygen mask, whatever metaphor you choose to use, the better we're able to serve those we're intended to serve. So what does recovery look like? What does self-care look like? Um, I think it looks, as the signs would suggest, a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. Um, but what I want to do now is talk through um, some different self-care strategies that have been effective for me in my life. But rather than just say, here's something you should do because I do it, which would obviously be arrogant and crazy. Um, what I want to do is preface it by uh, bringing in research on that strategy and showing you that science says it works, that I can tell you from my own experience that it works, um, and then encourage you to explore it as a way to take care of yourself, particularly during uh, this pandemic. So for me, recovery is mindfulness. It's probably the first um, self-care technique that I learned and really embraced that's really changed 
my life. And mindfulness and meditation um, is really an Eastern philosophy that's been around for thousands of years. But it's a philosophy that's only really been accepted in practice by Western science in about the last 50, 25 years. Um, and one of the men very much responsible for bringing um, mindfulness into the, uh, the Western eye was a guy named John Kabat-Zinn. And he's considered the, the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction, which you'll commonly see uh, as an acronym MBSR. And you can read a little bit about it. It's very interesting, but essentially MBSR is bringing that Eastern philosophy of mindfulness, of awareness, um, of attention into practice. Um, and what you find is a ton of benefits. So I've listed only a couple here, but uh, I promise you the list of mindfulness benefits is long and deep. Um, so benefits of mindfulness include lowering your heart rate, lowering your blood pressure, lowering your cortisol, and cortisol is your stress chemical. When you get stressed out, when you have a fight, flight, or freeze response, cortisol gets released and your stress levels go up, right? So lower, lower, lower cortisol means less stress. Uh, a reduction in depressive symptoms. Improve longevity. Improve that, that, what does that mean? That means you live longer, right? Mind, for goodness sake, mindfulness can extend your life. Um, so lots and lots of value to mindfulness. Lots of good research behind it. Um, I know to some people it can feel, um, especially if you identify it so much with like Eastern philosophy, it can feel a little bit out there. Um, but what's so cool about John Kabat-Zinn's research is he's grounding it and saying, hey, um, this may seem a little different, may seem a little outside the norm of, of what you're used to, but there's good evidence to support it, right? So I want to share with you a couple of mindfulness strategies that um, are evidence-based and that I've found to be really effective. And the first that I learned sitting in a detox unit in Nashville, Tennessee, in heroin withdrawals, very miserable, I learned a deep breathing technique. And one of the things that I learned early on is that deep breathing is not just about catching your breath, but it's about bringing attention to your breath. And because uh, I'm a neurotic person and my mind spins out of control, mindfulness is something that I never thought I'd be able to engage in. And this was my first foray into mindfulness. And it kind of allowed me to ease into it. So the way that I like to do deep breathing is by imagining a square. Um, and so what you can imagine is as you take an inhale, you inhale for four seconds, and then you're gonna hold with full lungs for four seconds. And then you're gonna exhale for four seconds. And then you're gonna hold empty lungs for four seconds. So you can see how you can imagine in your mind's eye that you're breathing in a square. So in all, um, that's a 16 second uh, rotation. And if you do that 10 times, right, it takes you about three minutes. Um, that's an incredibly, incredibly effective way um, to lower your cortisol, to lower your heart rate, to bring attention back to your breath and to center yourself. And I'd encourage you to try that. It's free. It's always available to you. You can do it anywhere, wherever you are. Um, you know, like I'm not going to do it right now in the middle of a webinar. That might be a little weird, but, uh, but you get the idea. I think an incredibly effective technique. Your breath is always with you. Um, I want to share some other ones that have been helpful for me. I got really into Zen meditation, which I recognize for many people is one of those that'll seem a little out there, but there is a tremendous amount of literature to support Zen meditation for all kinds of self-care. Um, what I used to do for a long time was set an alarm on my phone, um, maybe for as little as 10 minutes um, and sometimes as long as 45 minutes and to sit and try to continuously bring my attention back to my breath, sometimes counting breaths, but I find that really challenging. So one thing that I've found that's really cool, um, I hope you all can see this. Uh, th these are my mala beads. And this came from um, a friend of mine when I finished my qualifying exam. My friend Amanda bought these for me. And mala beads um, are a, a great uh, meditation aid. And in general, mala necklaces have 108 beads. And what you'll do is you'll hold the necklace in your hand. And each bead represents a breath. So rather than counting breaths, you can count beads and breathe with the beads. And it's sort of um, a counting instrument that allows you to take your focus off of counting in your head and bring your focus back to your breath. Um, and the other thing that I just, I just considered as, as, as I was thinking about mala beads is it'd be a great arts and crafts project. If you have kids at the house, if you're looking for something to do, um, your necklace wouldn't necessarily have to have 108 beads. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the great things I learned about mindfulness is just, uh, is just acceptance. 
if your mala necklace has 107 beads, accept it. That's okay, right? That's mindfulness in practice. Um, th then what I started to learn as I started to really engage with mindfulness is I learned that it's something that you can bring to bear on virtually every single aspect of your life, right? It's not just about the 30 minutes you set aside to do breathing or meditation or yoga. This is actually something that you can bring to bear on every moment of your life. So for instance, there's a thing called a working meditation. And as its name suggests, you're sort of meditating while you're working. It's where you're focusing very intently on doing what you're doing. So this is, this is really gonna be more effective with a, a, a little bit more of a mundane task. So you don't wanna try working meditation as you're trying to write a paper, probably. But let's say you're doing dishes, right? Uh, or you are um, folding laundry. The, how about the example Dr. Hunter loves, anyone who knows Dr. Hunter knows she loves to iron, right? She loves ironing. And I think what she's tapping into a little bit, we'd have to explore this with her. Um, I think what she's tapping into a little bit is a working meditation, where when you become focused on doing what you're doing, you become absorbed on, on task in the moment, your mind doesn't, have, doesn't wander elsewhere, right? Um, and it can be just as effective at lowering heart rate, at helping to center you. Um, it reminds me of, of uh, ESPN did a 30 for 30, which is a documentary called Basketball Junkie. And you all know I hate that word. That's a very stigmatizing term, but that was the title of the documentary about Chris Heron, who was a NBA basketball player for the Boston Celtics, and he got addicted to opioids. And he describes his experience in his first treatment center where he had to work for 12 hours a day rinsing pots and pans for the entire therapeutic community where he was in treatment. And he talked about how his mind was running out of control and every second he wanted to leave that place and how the pots and pans became a tangible way for him to focus his attention and to stay in the moment. And what he's tapping into is working meditation, right? You can do the same thing with walking. I think walking meditation is the coolest, you all. Um, so walking meditation, again, is about doing what you're doing, bringing your attention to what you're doing. So instead of walking for, to get from point A to point B, you're walking to walk, right? So you're walking with attention brought to my heel meets the ground first, and then I feel my foot roll on the concrete to the ball of my foot, focusing on the tangible experience, focusing on your breathing, uh, a mindful walking state. In fact, I got the chance last year to do a guided walking meditation at a park here in Lexington, which was very cool, where we put on um, headsets and we had a guide who walked us through uh, the park where he had created music that went along with the walk and um, kind of guided our meditation. It was very cool, really cool mindful practice. Um, and then the last one that I would suggest that, that I've used that's been helpful has been yoga. And I've really started doing yoga a lot more since COVID-19 because I've had to explore ways to exercise inside. Um, and there's a strong, strong, robust literature for yoga. And the thing I love about yoga is that it can be adapted for any level, any ability, any fitness level. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, everyone, everyone benefits, both mind and body. Others, there are certainly a long list of other mindfulness techniques. Um, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat, talk about it uh, amongst yourselves. But I would uh, leave you with this on mindfulness, agi quad agis, which is Latin for do what you're doing. And it comes from a great story that I love. I don't have time to share. But the point is, do what you're doing. If you're walking, walk to walk, right? Don't walk to get somewhere. Walk for the purpose of walking in that moment. Just be. I love it. And then two quick tips as you're getting started for mindfulness. Things that I think uh, are helpful, whether you're talking about yoga, whether we're talking about a walking meditation, whatever it is, the key is awareness. The key is having an awareness, right? So we say awareness, awareness, awareness. You're, you're an observer of what you're experiencing. So if I'm sitting and I'm meditating, and as often happens, let's say in three seconds, my mind already begins to wander to the work that I need to do this afternoon. That's okay. You don't beat yourself up. You don't say, oh my goodness, I'm doing meditation wrong. No, there is no doing wrong. The, the right way to do mindfulness practice is just to do mindfulness practice, right? So if you're sitting in your practice and three seconds in, your mind wanders to work, all you have to do is be aware of it, right? Don't beat yourself up. All you have to do is go, ah, my mind wandered a bit. And then very gently bring your mind back to your breath, bring your attention and your focus back to your breath. And guess what? 
Six seconds later, your mind's gonna wander again, and that's okay, because that's what this practice is all about. Bringing your attention back to the now, back to your breath. And, and let's forego the judgment, not only as a part of mindfulness practice, but how about just in general, among our colleagues, among our friends, this is called a novel coronavirus or a nora coronavirus, which means new, right? Because we've never seen this before. We've never experienced a pandemic like this before. We've never experienced this. And because it's new to all of us, I think all of us benefit from showing each other a little bit of grace. And that begins, much like self-care, with showing yourself grace. Second uh, tip for mindfulness would be that we call it a practice for a reason that you all know full well, just because you eat a salad one time doesn't mean you'll be um, you know, in great health. Just because you go on a run one time doesn't mean you're ready for a marathon. Um, things require practice. And much in the same way, in order to experience the full weight and benefit of mindfulness practice, it's something that you wanna do on a consistent basis. Um, you, you will get acute immediate benefits from any of those aforementioned mindfulness practices immediately, no question. But you get more benefit when you do them cons consistently. The second um, self-care technique that I think is really important, that's really hard to overstate, shout out to our family health specialist, Natalie, um, is exercise. There's such strong evidence for using exercise for any mental health condition, for substance use disorder, for the, the general population. So I wanted to share with you one study that I think is important. Um, it's called the SMILE study, which is appropriately named when we're talking about happiness or lack thereof. So SMILE stands for the Standard Medical Intervention and Long-Term Effects of Exercise Study. So essentially what it was, was a study comparing um, exercise and medication in the treatment of depression. So what the researchers did is they divided a, a sample of folks who had clinical depression into three distinct groups. The first group received an SSRI, which is um, it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So essentially an antidepressant like Prozac, let's say for instance. Um, group two was ordered to do uh, 45 minutes of cardiovascular exercise three days a week. And then group three did both. They took the medication and did the exercise. And at, at three months, at the conclusion of the study, all three groups had shown a considerable improvement in their depressive symptoms. And there was no statistically significant difference among the groups. So in layman's terms, everybody got better, but no one group got much better than the others. However, six months later, the researchers did a follow-up to see how many of those changes and those improvements in depression had been sustained over the six months and only one group showed sustained improvement, and that was group two, the exercise-only group. And so here's the conclusion that I hope you draw from this study, and also the conclusion that I hope you do not draw from this study. I am not suggesting that folks who struggle with depression need only exercise to deal with their depression, okay? I'm also not suggesting folks who have clinical depression don't need to take medication, right? Um, I'm not a healthcare provider, that is between you and, and your provider, 100%. I fully support the use of um, all paths to recovery for all people, whether that looks like medication or exercise, no matter what. The only conclusion that I want you to draw from this study is that exercise is effective, right? Whether you're already happy and you wanna be happier, whether you're depressed and you wanna see an improvement in your depressive symptoms, it doesn't matter, exercise works. Exercise works in giving you that acute benefit that Natalie Jones could tell you about when she finishes an Ironman and she's got a runner's high and she's got endorphins flying around her body and she feels terrific. But it also has chronic benefits, right? Over the long term, that it's gonna improve your health and wellness. Um, and I'll give you a pro tip, something that just, one of the reasons I like incorporating a little bit of exercise or even just movement throughout the day is because I think that they make for more effective breaks when I'm trying to be productive throughout the day. And I'll tell you what I mean. If I wake up in the morning and I do, you know, some good work from eight to 12 or whatever it is. And I decide that I'm going to take a break for lunch and I'm going to sit and I'm going to eat and I'm going to scroll on my phone. Then when that time is up and it's time to go back to work, I feel sluggish. Um, I've lost all my momentum, right? And one of the things I like about taking an exercise break or a movement break is I don't lose that inertia. I still experience the same refreshment of having moved away from my workstation and coming back. 
Except in the meantime, I kept the inertia going. So that way when I finish with a walk or a workout, whatever it is, I can come right back down and get back to work like I haven't skipped a step. Uh, and my other tip would, to you would be to find what you enjoy. I think uh, with exercise, we have to find things that we're actually going to do, right? Um, so all of us would like to be able to run an Ironman with Natalie, but the reality is I don't think all of us can do it. I know I can't do it. Um, so instead, what I have to do is find what I enjoy and what works for me. And over the past few weeks, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have access to some weights. So I've been able to do some weightlifting. I've done more walking, you all, over the last, I'd say two months, more intentional walking over the last two months than I've done in my entire life. And it's been really, really good. It's been really good to be in the sunshine, to get some vitamin D and just be outside. It's a good thing. Um, and then, like I said, I've, I've been doing quite a bit of yoga, um, all things that have acute and chronic benefits. And so I'd encourage you to explore what, what enjoyable exercise looks like for you. Maybe it's playing a game of some sort. Uh, I know I detest cardio, so I like to do, uh, to play basketball instead. That's kind of out right now because of social distancing. Um, I think Natalie has written something on using resistance bands. Um, and that's a pretty affordable way to be able to exercise in your home if you're interested. So I'll leave the exercise expertise to Natalie just to say we know that exercise is effective for people in recovery from anything. Third, recovery is rest, relaxation, and recreation. And for a long time, I felt nervous about thinking of leisure time as a part of self-care, but it can be if it's intentional. So I, I want to talk about this. Um, so a LexisNexis survey of 1,700 white-collar workers, people who work in finance or whatever it is, found that the average employee spends more time receiving or managing information than they actually do using that information to do their jobs. And I, maybe that sounds crazy to you. As soon as I read that, I thought, hey, that sounds a lot like me. That sounds a lot like us in extension, particularly at a time when we're dealing with so many things that are in flux. We're, we're receiving email update after email update. We're constantly changing what we're doing, adapting and adjusting. And oftentimes it seems we spend more time managing than actually doing work, right? And what's more, in that same study, about 50% of the workers said they're quickly approaching a tipping point where they can't handle all the incoming information anymore, right? And I, I can identify with this right off the bat, um, that sometimes it seems like it's just too much coming in, too much stimulation, too much data, and not enough time to work with it, right? And that's why rest and relaxation is so important. Research shows like mindfulness, it'll reduce your cortisol levels, reduce your stress. It'll boost your Im immune system, which is so critically important at a time like this. It improves your quality of sleep. It actually improves your productivity. That's counterintuitive. Taking intentional breaks, being intentional about rest and relaxation actually boosts your productivity. And then once again, promotes longevity, a longer life. And one of the things that you'll notice that is shared by all of the strategies that I'm talking about today is that they have to be done intentionally. I'm not talking about accidental mindfulness where you realize, oh yeah, I breathe, right? Or I, I think about my breath. I'm not talking about accidental rest where you finish some work and you stay there on the couch for another 10 minutes. I'm talking about being intentional about saying for the next hour, my purpose is to rest and relax. I'm being intentional. I'm being deliberate about rest and relaxation, prioritizing it. And part of that looks like setting boundaries. And I know that during COVID-19, as so many of us have gone online, we're so, I never thought I could be more tethered to my email than I was before COVID-19. And I'm shocked that now I'm even more tethered to my email. And it makes it really hard to turn off, right? Um, even after five o'clock or whenever your work is done, as the emails roll in, we sort of have become accustomed to being um, plugged into the news feed at all times, the work feed. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is find your off switch and, and do that without guilt, which is really the challenge to find your off switch and say, it's not only my, my right, my prerogative, it's actually what, what makes me a more effective employee, a more effective husband, mother, father, whatever it is, if I'll find my off switch for a little while and take some time um, for intentional rest. And so that's also why I've said taking dedicated breaks. 
Um, I'm not just talking about if you're working on a couple of big projects, um, giving yourself five minutes between projects. I, I mean being intentional about prioritizing rest and relaxation. And yes, that includes taking breaks from news and the media. Um, we're, we're fortunate in the, in the age of social media to all be very much informed. Uh, I think there's such a thing as being over-informed. And when it comes to self-care, one of the things that each of us needs to be responsible for ourselves is determining how much information is good for me and how much information is overload. And I don't know that there's science to tell you how to figure that out. All I know to tell you is it's something that we all have to decide for ourselves. Be intentional about setting a boundary around, I think I've had enough news for the day. I think I've had enough. I think it's time for me to stop um, and rest and relax. And the last strategy I wanna share with you today is connection. And this is uh, a self-care strategy that it, it has taken me a long time to, to really embrace. And, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, anxiety included, but for, for, for whatever reason, um, it took me a long time to see how connecting with other people really feeds my energy. And so Johan Hari, who's a popular author, has coined this phrase that, that, that uh, I think is pretty powerful, that the opposite of addiction is not um, uh, sobriety or abstinence, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so you can imagine why during COVID-19, this is such a dangerous time for people in recovery and for people in general, because we're all isolating. If you're a person with a mental health condition, um, risk of things like suicide, risk of things like self-harm, um, I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole down the list uh, of, of, of bad things, but uh, we're at increased risk because we're isolated, right? And it's especially problematic for those who have relied on a, a social network to support them as sort of a safety net as they've gone through their recovery, whatever they may be recovering from. And so one of the things that I think you really have to do is be proactive about meeting your own needs for human connection. So again, the theme tying all of these four self-care approaches together, whether it's mindfulness, exercise, whether it's um, connecting with other people, whatever this is, uh, what all of these things share is they, even rest and relax, relaxation, what they all share is that, that they need to be intentional. These are things that you decide you're going to do, right? You're intentional about doing it and you carve out time to do it. Um, in recovery, we talk about the thousand pound phone, which is sort of just a joke um, in talking about when, when things are hard, when you're really in a bad place, in a difficult spot. The time when you probably need to call someone the most is often the time when it's most difficult to call someone when all of a sudden it seems like that phone weighs a thousand pounds. Um, and whether that's pride or fear, or whatever it is that keeps us from reaching out, um, I would encourage you to take responsibility. It's, it's your job to manage, to care for yourself, to manage yourself right, and to manage um, your need for human connection. And so I wanted to also provide a number of ways that folks in recovery can do that um, because you know, uh, mutual aid organizations and 12-step meetings and things of that nature aren't meeting in person um, for the most part, uh, you can go online. And so this is a graphic from the Recovery Research Institute. If you go to recoveryanswers.org, you can find some of this information that they provided. And it gives you a list of, of resources for AA and NA, smart recovery, which is sort of based on uh, cognitive behavioral principles. Um, a number of, of things that are available. Virtually any kind of mutual aid organization that used to exist meeting face-to-face -face has in some way been converted online. And just a, a couple of clicks and you can find your way there. I also wanted to share with you um, some, some just particularly interesting resources. In the Rooms uh, is a resource that um, has been doing virtual meetings, sort of like, um, like, like, like we're doing right now, right? Doing um, sort of not in person, but virtual meetings and in the rooms has been doing that for people in recovery for years, um, long before COVID-19. Um, so they're kind of the front runner in that regard. Tempest is a resource that offers a lot of different recovery support services. So you can get online meetings there. You can also access um, sort of like peer coaching. Um, there's, there's even like a recovery hangout where you can go and just socialize. Um, and then finally, the Connections app is for iOS or Android or, or whatever operating system you have, um, 
It's an application that was developed by a group called the Addiction Policy Forum um, in collaboration with some others. And it has a lot of cool features. It allows people to track their sobriety date, allows them to um, connect with other people, set reminders, um, all sorts of helpful things to resource people uh, in recovery. So that's a, that's a quick, quick snapshot of some resources that are available. As I said before, um, if you're interested in more information on that, we're really gonna spend some time unpacking the, the profound and numerous ways that coronavirus is impacting the, the whole world of prevention, treatment, and recovery. So that'll be May 14th um, at 11 that we'll, we'll cover some more of that information. To recap our day to day, I think the things that, that tie together all four strategies are about being intentional, about being intentional about taking care of yourself, saying this is a time that I'm setting aside to take care of my needs. It's about being mindful. It's about bringing awareness to what you're doing. It's also about gratitude. Um, one of the last things I wanted to share, one of the last strategies, I, I didn't incorporate it into a full strategy, but um, in her book on happiness, Dr. Lubomirsky talks extensively about the science of gratitude. The, the way that having an attitude of gratitude can change your perspective in an instant. And so we've all lost a lot in, during coronavirus, during COVID-19. There's plenty for us to grieve, um, but the reality is that uh, we're working together and and what we see in collaborating and coming together and supporting each other is something that we wouldn't have seen without it. So try to find the silver lining, right? Try to find the gratitude. Um, it'll do your mind and your body a lot of good. And the last tip maybe is be, just be, just, uh, just allow yourself to exist as you are and have a little grace for how you're feeling um, in this moment. So let me leave you with this. For me, recovery looks like self-care. Um, when you think about that definition of recovery, when you think about where you're headed, maybe your life goals, your five-year plan, whatever it is, every day what it looks like for me is taking care of myself. And what I've shown you is the ways that I do that and the evidence behind them. Um, so the question I would pose to you is, what is it that you're recovering from? And what does that recovery look like for you? Maybe what are some strategies that you're going to adopt to bring a mindfulness practice into your day? Um, or to get a little bit more movement in your day, have a little more rest in your day, or maybe to connect to a friend um, a little more meaningfully. So that's all I've got for you today. Don't forget uh, to, to join us again May 14th at 11 a.m. Uh, for the next Zoom. I, I think the next of our colleagues that we have to go is Wednesday uh, is Dr. Norman Bergdahl. So hopefully Mindy can confirm that for us in the chat. I wanted to make sure and um, advertise that as well. And if you all have any questions for right now, I'd be happy to take them. Dr. Ellswick is correct. Um, Dr. Norman Bergdorf and um, Jeannie Nager from the Nutrition um, Education Program will be sharing with us on Wednesday about stocking your pan pantry. Um, and as um, Dr. Ellswick said, if we have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we will get those answered. If you're watching this on record, you can still um, put questions in the comment section on Facebook, and we will get those questions to Dr. Ellswick to get an answer for you there. Um, if you have questions that you would like answered um, personally, then you can send those questions to ukfcsext at uky.edu, and we will make sure to get those questions to Dr. Ellswick directly. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I think I'm not seeing any questions. Um, and are you seeing any rolling on your Facebook Live feed, Dr. Ellswick? I'm not seeing anything right now, and I'm not getting right. anything from Maria. So, all right, then I think we are ready to wrap this up. I'm going to uh, take away your share and share our last screen for the day. I think. Stop sharing there. It's always it's always interesting if it's gonna work or not. Um, well, and it's not working the way it's supposed to. Maybe we'll get there. Um, we just won't worry about that right now, maybe. You look good though, Mindy. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, it, Always, always something for people to look at now. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, right. let's see. I think this is going to work this time. 
Mindy, while you're talking about and consumer sciences extension at the University of Kentucky, our agents share research knowledge with individuals, families, and communities to improve quality of life. Building strong families, building Kentucky. It starts with us. Sally, did you have a question? Uh, well, I don't, but it is in the chat box here. They would like to have the cup slide that was used in the presentation, if that could be put where they could use it on Facebook. Dr. Ellswick, can you can you get that to me? I Sorry, I was good. muted. Yes, we can do that. Okay, great. Sounds good. All right, and just remember if you're still with us and this was your first time to put that in the chat box or in comments, we would love to know that you're that you are here. Um, and otherwise, we will see you on Wednesday. Thank you all and have a great day.